Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And yes, Rao Paul loves the smell of more cowbell in the morning. This is a post that he put up. And what's going on here? Well, it's all about global liquidity. China announced a substantial liquidity injection, $141 billion into its financial markets. And it's also mentioning an additional liquidity is possible for supporting stocks. So it's signaling a further boost, which could mean a global trend that well, suggests an increase of 10 trillion total supply, bringing it close to 100 trillion. The European Central Bank also expects a rate cut. The market indicators, according to Rao Paul, typically lag by about 10 weeks. So yeah, we're talking about late October, the beginning of November. We're going to be full on in this bull run. One of those early movers has been SWE. It currently is up 5% along with Cardano and Polkadot. And anytime you see the memes like Floki and Bonk doing double digit gains, those are indicators that there's just a lot of sloshing of liquidity around. Dog with hat is up. 14% on the 24 hour. It's the number one gainer. So it tells you that the liquidity is flowing. Now, XRP seems stuck, right? What's going on? Let me explain something that just came across as a post on X. Arthur from XP Markets had a theory. And yes, he did the numbers. And I want to thank him for doing that because it backs up his theory. This XRP ledger ecosystem needs more decentralized app users and power users to be more precise. Hodling in cold storage is not going to cut it. And if you keep money in an account forever, the economy simply doesn't move anywhere. And it's the same for crypto. One of the comments in the share that I did said that all of his uh, XRP was in a wallet, and that main rule is not to keep assets on exchanges. So is this the way? And what Arthur is explaining is you don't need to have your assets on an exchange to interact with a decentralized app. It's actually the opposite. You need to have a personal wallet to interact with a decentralized app. So. Yeah, it has nothing to do with bringing your assets on to an exchange. It has everything to do with finding an app that is interesting to you and that you want to use. And then, of course, it gets down to the core problem that we have is there's not enough apps. We need more developers to build apps that people are interested in. That is going to be a key to get the XRP ecosystem to move. In yesterday's video, I got a lot of comments about my um, saying that the dollar is strong and that, that it has an interesting, uh, bright future. And people are, are so emotional that they uh, really believe that the dollar is dead. Well, it can't be farther from the truth. The USD backed stablecoins have further entrenched its role and it is now dollarizing global portfolios. Here is uh, something that was put out just a couple of days ago from the Financial Stability Board, the FSB, and they cite the largest Latin American bank, PDG Practual. They have 260 billion assets under management. They have had a huge success with their USD pegged stablecoin. And the interesting thing about it is that it also eliminates the need for an overseas bank account. Now that is a ramification that maybe a lot of people haven't thought of or haven't talked about yet. I'm one of those people who sign up for everything. Yeah, I give everything a try. And I had given a try to Greg Kidd's company hard yaka newsletter about what well, it seems like two years ago it is fabulous it's probably my favorite and uh, if you don't know greg kidd he's a a uh, early investor into the company ripple and he was also one of their first if not the first if i remember correctly chief compliance officer his big feature 
article and message today was uh, why fintechs should be banks. So will Ripple go for a bank license? Oh, it's never been a better time than now to be a bank, especially for companies where financial services are their core offering. And we know that is Ripple's core offering. So he gets down into explaining that lending will be an important part of the long-term strategy. Becoming a bank can be transformational. The most impactful financial benefit of a bank charter is superior lending economics through accepting and lending out customer deposits. And we know that is one of the big use cases for DeFi. You also have more firmly in control of the regulatory process and the product roadmap and are able to market yourself as a bank. Benefits that will accrue across all financial services products not just lending. So yes, it just really makes sense. Pairing these benefits with a fintech company like Ripple, for example, I'm putting that one in, the, gives them unique advantages of distribution, which they really need distribution for the real USD stablecoin, their product, which is their stablecoin now, and the brand. Yeah, they are absolutely a... <laughs> a brand machine with their marketing. So the bank charter can accelerate their growth, improve profitability, which yes, they do need because uh, according to the SEC documents, uh, they were drawing almost all of their revenue from selling the digital asset XRP and they need to create a durable competitive advantage. So, yep, I'm going out on a limb. I had made the prediction that they were going to put out a stable coin. That came true. I'm now putting out the prediction that they're going to become a bank. As I've been telling you over the past couple of days, I've spent a lot of time on an archived now, um, you know, put to retirement Ripple forum, which was where all of the early talk took place about the ledger and the company Ripple. And I'm accessing all of that conversation through the Wayback Machine. I'm having a good time doing it. I uncovered uh, part of the transactions that are in those missing um, ledger transactions that occurred. And Mickey B. Fresh, I want to give him a shout out. He put a, a, a video that David had uh, done with um, Charlie Shrem and explained what happened in those missing ledgers. And I think it's worth uh, listening to again because it caused a little bit of a stir on, on X, mostly because I, I think a lot of people who are new to the, to the XOP ecosystem maybe were unaware of this, but it's a great explanation by David to Charlie Shrem. I'm gonna let it, him take you out on this video. So until next time, Yes, do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye. Uh, tell me an untold story. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to tell you one that I think will help a lot of people to understand something that I think is widely misunderstood about the very very early days of the XRP ledger. So, you have to understand that we built in things and threw them away all the time because we didn't know what was going to work and what wasn't. We didn't have a finalized roadmap and then we executed that roadmap. It wasn't like that at all. The very first idea that we had was sort of consensus without mining. And, but we didn't have an idea of like, what would the ledger look like? What would transactions look like? What would the functionality of the system be? Because we didn't know what it would be good for. So the idea was just consensus without mining. Like it was just yes. theory at that point. Yes. And in fact, in, in the very beginning, it was just, is it possible? Is it possible? Um, that was Jed McCaleb's original idea. Basically, could you develop a distributed agreement algorithm that didn't require proof of work and use that in place of proof of work to solve the double spend problem in a decentralized blockchain? And at the time, it's possible the answer was no. Like, we didn't know if that was possible. We didn't have a well-formed concept of, of how to do it. And I'll, I'll tell you the most surprising thing, while I'll detour a little bit on the story, just to tell you, like, from a technical standpoint, the most surprising thing is it turns out that that's a lot easier than you might initially think. You have to remember at the time, everybody thought that proof of work was Bitcoin's secret sauce, and many people still do today. But what we immediately realized was that 
All you need to do to solve the double spend problem is put transactions in a global order mired in the technical details because we could sort of talk about them forever. So we were building that consensus algorithm and, and, and um, we didn't have any of the other ideas down. And then once we discovered that we could get that to work, we set up three servers because three, like one um, doesn't prove that you have a consent, one, now, one computer coming to consensus doesn't do anything. The problem with two is you constantly get into 50-50 splits, which is ugly. So three is like a good, like minimum number to set up. And we would write code and push it out to those three servers like multiple times a day because nobody was relying on the system. And we were just, we were just like, it was probably the most productive time of my life. The, uh, the commit record is public. So you can actually go to GitHub and you can actually see, like you can track our development through this time period. So there is a historical record uh, open to the public uh, to show allow them to watch everything that we were doing at that time period. And, and, and we had this rapid cycle where we would build code, deploy it, test it, run it, build code, deploy it, test it, run it. And of course, after a while, the cycle started to slow down as the code became more stable. And um, sometimes we would have to reset the ledger and sometimes we would keep the ledger. So like if we, if we made a code change that broke binary compatibility so that the code couldn't understand like the previous ledgers, we would start the ledger over. And if we didn't break binary compatibility, we wouldn't. Now, this is the amazing untold story part. At some point in that development, um, I think it was um, June 2012 or so, at some point in that development, we just didn't reset the ledger anymore. No. Oh. We just stopped. So how now, this is, the, this is the, because there was, no, there was no technical need to. There was no technical need to reset the ledger, and so we just stopped resetting it. So the weird thing is that like the ledger that is like now the live running XRP ledger in the world was not special when it was created or started. It was one of thousands and thousands of ledgers that, you know, Arthur, Jed, Chris Larson and I like created and destroyed. It, it, it just one time we're like, okay, there's no need to, and we, we didn't know it at the time. We thought, you know, it just so happened that we didn't make any changes that required a new, a new ledger. Isn't that, is the, so if you think about it, like the public XRP ledger chain that starts now, like was just one of thousands that we created and destroyed in this rapid chain of innovation. And there was just never a reason, obviously now it would be completely impractical to restart it. And we couldn't do it because we'd have to convince like all yeah. the validator operators. Cause at that time there were, there were several people, myself and Jed who had, uh, and probably Arthur who had access to all three machines. And so they could have restarted the entire ledger or not. And we, and then we went into sort of a beta period where we allowed people access to the ledger. And there was this thought that we might reset the ledger or we might not. And we just never did that. Uh, so here's another funny, here's another hilariously funny bit. If you fire up the XRP ledger software yourself today and you don't connect it to the network, it will create a new Genesis ledger. It'll create a new blockchain from scratch. That's what it does if you don't tell it to do anything else. And there will be a hundred billion XRP in the sort of Genesis account and you can transfer it. The password is well known. I think it's master password. So it's like a, it's like a, the password generates a private key. You just use I'm master. It's master. my own XRP right now. You can. And here's, so this is the hilarious part. When we opened that ledger to the public um, during the beta, there was still money in the master account. No one had emptied it. Oh, so you God. can just connect to the software and just take XRP just the same way the founders did, the same way Ripple, you know, the same way the founders did. You could just take money out of that Genesis account. And people did. And they didn't, nobody emptied it. They just took like what they needed to experiment. And those people still have XRP today that they just took out of that Genesis account. Oh, I kind of want to know if anyone's holding any XRP of the old ledger, like the previously un restarted like the one that's dead like you know you restarted these ledgers is there a, is there a ledger out there with account holders that someone could download an old version of the software and start playing with that ledger that was never restarted remember someone restarted an old ledger we we made a lot of that data public um, because we had an incident after 32,000 ledgers where data got lost there was a bug in the software that caused history to get lost and we were we we could have restarted the ledger just for that, but it didn't require a ledger restart. And we just sort of assumed that there'll probably be a need for a ledger restart. And so we didn't do anything about it. And so there are some early ledgers that are lost. And we made all, all of the data we had at the time public in the hopes that people would be able to assist us in recovering the lost data. And some data was recovered. So there is like some of that data floating out there, but I don't know that there are any complete ledgers 
uh, from before that time. But there, there might be, I don't know if people, that data is still available. If anybody wants to, you know, download it and analyze it, they can find trans, like you can find transactions from previous ledger streams. So we didn't clear the transaction database always. And so you will find transactions from previous ledger streams, but I don't know that there's enough to assemble the, uh, an entire ledger.